So, welcome uh, to the first symposium session uh, of the extra class, the amateur extra class for uh, 2018. Uh, for the new students, this is something we did last year, uh, not only uh, try to teach the material, but uh, try to talk about some practical aspects. Um, uh, for those of you who like this, in about two weeks, we're going to have uh, some uh, folks who visited us before, uh, but talking on different topics. Uh, Tom Witherspoon, K4SWL, uh, will be coming, uh, and uh, Tom is going to be talking about SDRs, uh, especially the new uh, inexpensive software-defined radio receivers uh, that are available on the market. Uh, I've specifically asked him to talk about um, recording spectrum, which is something you can do, record an entire range of frequencies onto your computer, uh, and then play them back later and tune around and, and retune. Yeah, Gary? Will you send us another email about that? Please? I'll send you another email, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so uh, Tom is going to be coming to talk about SDRs. And then uh, Vlad Karamitrov, uh, N3CZ, who was here before and talked to us a little bit about his uh, uh, ham radio experiences overseas, he started a new business. Uh, he's an excellent electronic technician, and he's doing ham radio repair. Uh, so uh, in Asheville, so he, he's local to us, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about troubleshooting. Uh, and uh, so he's a great resource to have in your back pocket in case you've got a problem. So uh, we invite you uh, to come back. So tonight the topic is uh, PL259 connectors, and I was talking to Tom on the phone earlier this afternoon, and he said, Gary, you're not going to believe what happened to me. Well, let me trade places with him. And uh, if you'd share with the audience what happened, uh, what was going on with you. <laughs> Wrong Tom. <laughs> okay. Um, no, no, you got to get in the middle. <laughs> well, uh, I soldered all of my uh, connectors, I don't know, probably six or eight months ago. Everything's been working fine. I had to move my antenna. When I did, I disconnected it from the radio, and I bagged it, sealed it up. It was probably three weeks before I got back to it. And condensation had gotten in the bag already and had ruined that connector. I didn't find out until I plugged it in the radio, and the radio wasn't working properly. So I did troubleshoot, found that, cold it back till I got it back to where I thought everything was good. Soldered another 259 on. We're smoking. We're good to go. I've made... Probably 800 contacts with it, and just just in the last week or two, uh, started realizing that my receive capabilities were slowly going down. And uh, N0TR called me last night, I guess, or texted me about 10:30, and said, "Hey, S South Africa's on. He's loud. He's clear. Easy workable." I ran in there, turned on my radio, and I couldn't I couldn't even make out what he was saying. I went, okay, it's time to do some troubleshooting. So I was going to call Gary and get the antenna analyzer and uh, troubleshoot it. And I, sit, I was sitting in front of the computer this morning, and I went, let's do the simplest thing first, Tom. And I looked at the back of the radio, and my feed line was at a real sharp angle coming out. You could tell it was torqued, and I went, hmm, okay, wait a minute here. I unscrewed it, backed it off, went, hmm, and it fell off of my hand. <laughs> I went, well, I can fix that. I sat down and I soldered another one on and went, good to go. All right, this is perfect. I'm going to stick it back on there and we'll, it's all going to be cleared up. <laughs> Gave it the little test, a little bit of torque on it, it <laughs> twisted right off. I went, okay, good thing we're having this class tonight. So <laughs> but, so I'm, I'm, I'm here to learn. <laughs> all right, I'll trade back with you. Thank you. And, and that's, that's a, a perfect illustration of the frustrations of PL259 connectors. Uh, and, you know, I was first licensed in 1969, uh, got out of the hobby, was relicensed then in uh, the mid 80s. And I've had, you know, lots of problems with PL259s. Now, watch if you have your ham shack and you've got some cables and whatnot, watch a senior ham. They're really sneaky about doing this. They'll come over to your ham shack, and they'll just casually look around, and then they'll pick up one of your cables, 
and they'll start unscrewing the shield on the cable to look and see how well are these connections soldered. In my case, nah, probably not so good. So that's the reason we're having uh, this uh, presentation tonight. So um, let me start out, and um, uh, then we're going to have Greg Lambert come up, and he'll show us uh, an alternate uh, point of view on uh, possible ways of uh, connecting connectors. Um, so you're familiar with the PL259, the Amphenols, and the various Chinese varieties um, for RG8. And then they have flavors with the um, inserts that you can use for RG8X or RG59, if anybody ever still uses those. Um, getting enough heat on this connection right here in the middle, where they say to solder the holes, uh, is really a problem. Um, especially if you're using foam coaxial cable, you'll have a tendency to melt the foam in the center before you get a good connection. Um, so, I finally, after years of fighting these things, said, I'm done. And so, I went out and bought a crimp connector, or a crimp tool for crimp uh, connections. I bought this uh, tool from a ham who's been in the industry for a long time, Jim Heath, W6LG. Uh, he lives uh, out in the Sierra Nevada mountains near Grass Valley. Uh, he was involved in high Sierra antennas for a long period of time. And then he had another little business that he was just selling um, crimp uh, connectors and tools and whatnot. So I bought this from him. Why do I bring this up? One of my recent projects was to install HF radio in my truck. Uh, I went to the Greenwood Ham Fest, and a guy there had hamstick antennas for just an unbelievably low price. And I said, I can't say no. <laughs> so then I had to figure out how to mount them. So I'm on the way. This is a true story, as Jim will back me up. I'm on the way to this class tonight. And I've got the 20-meter ham stick on, and I'm dialing uh, the, the single sideband portion of the 20-meter band. And I hear this voice. It's Jim Heath. W6LG talking to a new ham. I'm, I'm not sure where, um, but uh, as he concluded with him, I called him and he said, well, this is not my frequency. Let's go up three. So I followed him up three. We had a nice QSO. I was rolling down Wade Hampton, um, and um, he said, oh, Gary, I couldn't tell you were mobile. You sounded, you know, just fine. Um, and I, we talked about the audio quality and whatnot. I said, Jim, I'm going to a, a class tonight. I'm going to have your, your uh, crimp tool there. I'm going to tell them about crimp connectors. He says, oh, it's the only way to go. So, Greg, you've got a hard act to follow. <laughs> I'm not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> so my first suggestion um, is for whatever kind of cable connectors you decide to use is you put together a little kit. Um, and you can find, you know, these little things at ham fests or a hard kit or something even like the aluminum case I have down here. But put all of your connector tools in one place. There's nothing more frustrating than going, oh, where is that thing that I need? So that's, that's number one. Okay. Jim, if you're watching, I also bought these from you. These are crimp tools, um, rotary crimp tools that you, you put the cable inside, let it go down, and then you're supposed to you know, flip this around and then you know, pull it apart and then you, you've got everything. Anybody want these, I'll give them to you. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, they didn't work for me. But what does work, um, and I, for this class I said, oh, I, I, this is an excuse, I can buy these. Anybody ever seen these before? They're from DX Engineering. Um, and uh, these are crimp tools. Um, this is for the uh, RG8X. Uh, Strip tool, right? Not stripping tools. I'm sorry, not crimp tools. Uh, stripping tools. And this is for RG8. Let's see if we can do it. 
Mine's solid. It's not split in half that way, and I got it from the X Engineering there. Well, and, and they also they make um, also some cable grips that go with these, so that if you you know have hands that are um, uh, you know weak or whatnot, they give you a better grip on the cable. Uh, but there's a little slot here on one side. You put the cable in, close it down, hold on to the cable tight, rotate it around. Okay, that's step one. Then you take it and you take it in the other side, and there's one razor blade. You put it in the slot, clamp it down, and pull it up. And what that should have done, and we're going to get trimming. Um, they have a dance class upstairs. I've, I've made an uncommon comment before, but I won't repeat it. <laughs> and I didn't bring my small dikes. We can have a dance class too. <laughs> and the last little bit here is scored, but you still have to kind of use a knife to take off the last little bit of shield. All right. So here we've uh, prepared the cable and I've got the shield back. And does anybody know what I've done wrong? Touched it with your fingers. Nah, well, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. Um, this is just a really short piece of coax, so it's not going to kill me. Correct! And that is the most common problem with multi-part connectors, is you forget to put the other parts on. Never done that. Never done that. Before. So these are some really nice crimp connectors. The ones I'd gotten before from Jim and then on Amazon were okay. Uh, but these are from DX Engineering. You're welcome to come up and take a look at them. Um, okay, let's, we've got to do this backwards. So I'm coming the other way. Okay. No, let's see. That one first. Right. Anybody know what this little silver piece is called? It's called a ferrule. So here no. we have <laughs> here we have the DX engineering connector. Uh, it just slides on, as he says. All right, it's exactly the right length to hit the center. You don't have to really do any trimming on it. You put the ferrule down. And I could have trimmed that a, a little bit more. I'm not going to crimp it. I'm not going to waste the connector because they're about four bucks. But then you take. Um, the, the crimp tool, and you crimp around the ferrule, and, and I do it twice, uh, one up close to the connector, uh, one out uh, behind, um, and then put the outer screw connector on, and, oh, and you must still solder the center conductor. I've never had problems soldering the center conductor. It's always the shield that I have the problems with. So I'm a really strong advocate of these uh, crimp on PL259 uh, style connectors. Um, and so you're welcome to, uh, after we get done here, come on up and take a look uh, and, and see. But I, I think the connectors here from DX Engineering are about $3 a piece, $4 a piece. Um, but the, it's well worth it. Yes, Tom? Phil asked me if those would handle power well. I would think so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I use them on my legal limit amplifier. And yeah, um, with now I RG8X cable is rated for a thousand watts. So um, if you're going to do ready, you know, where it's a hundred percent duty cycle mode, you you need to move up to you know RG8 or um, 213 or LMR LM400 or whatever it is. So, but um, but uh, other than that, yeah, these connectors are are 
Primo. I got these connectors from DX Engineering, and I got these other ones you can take a look at. I got them from Amazon, made in China. And I'm going to use them. I'll, I'll use them up. But I think from now on, I'm going to buy my connectors from DX Engineering, even though they're more money. How much was the crimper? I'd say 75 bucks. No, I think it was less than that. It was about 60 um, But from DX Engineering, it's probably 75 DX Engineering yeah. is, is first class. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, and this is the soldering iron that I use. It's a it's a Weller gun. Uh, it's a, a dual temperature or dual wattage, not temperature, uh, 260 and 200 watts. Uh, and like somebody was saying, that it's got two positions on the on the switch. The middle position is the higher wattage, and the outer and the full in is the lower. That's why your surface mount looks so terrible on the end. Yeah, surface mount devices don't don't come out so good. Um, and finally, the, the biggest thing for in centering the center conductor um, is find a good solder. Because um, not all solders are created equal. Um, and I'm running low on this, but this is Kester TV radio stereo solder. Stereo solder, it's got to be good. Um, and this flows uh, the best uh, of any that I've, I've found. But it's known to be a cancer-causing agent in California. In, in Europe, you can't get this anymore. You must use lead-free <laughs> stuff. But, uh, so, any questions? All right. I'm going to take a little break here. We'll have Greg come up and tell us about an innovative solution that, uh, when he sent it to me, I said, oh, we got to do a, a meeting on this. So, uh, give us just a few minutes. This may not be correct or not. It's an old timer's way of doing things. But whenever I, I got 235 feet before I get to my antennas and I take this little device here and it's merely an SO 239 and it's shorted. And I go out there and I plug my antenna wire in and I go back to the radio and I measure the resistance on it with a very good fluke meter. Okay. A year from now, I'm having problems. I'm going to eliminate just the coax real quick like. I go out, I short the end of it. You don't have to take a jumper, and you've tried to do that, and the jumper falls off the time you get back in the house. Mm -hmm. That little old SO239 works really well. And you write down that impedance or resistance on a piece of paper, and you stick it in a drawer right there by your radio. And if it's like... 0.8 ohms or 0.9 ohms or whatever it might be. Next year when you go out there, if it's three or four or five or six or a hundred or a thousand ohms, you got a problem. Just one little thing. That... Great idea. Yeah, Thank you, Tom. That's super. Okay, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Greg. My call is K1IT. I've been licensed since 1962, so a bit before Gary which means I probably installed a few more PL259s than Gary's put on. But I've had all the problems with them. They're a nuisance. But I learned, like most of us, or any of you who are starting out, to solder a PL259 by doing what Gary described, which is you strip it, you put it into the barrel, you solder the end, and then you try and go around through these little holes and solder it and make sure you've got a good connection to the braid on the coax. Well, electrically, that's always dangerous because you melt the dielectric. You end up with little fingers of the shield that will short out your plug. Mechanically, it's a nightmare because if you take it and twist it, it's most likely going to come right off in your hand. So, uh, I was never comfortable doing it. I ran into lots of problems along the years. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. I always checked the continuity before I, after I started the ends on and, and used the cable to make sure I didn't have any shorts or, or opens in the cable. But uh, there was an article in QST, this QST is November of 2012, and you've got a copy of it there which shows an alternate method of soldering PL259s. Now, I didn't invent this method, but a fellow named Tim Duffy, who's uh, K3LR, has a big contest station out in western Pennsylvania. And if you've never seen the video of it, go on his website. 
it's I think the URL is in here. It's just K3LR, and he's got multiple antennas and multiple towers and you know the whole nine yards. And he's the one who wrote up uh, this alternate way of soldering PL259s on a cable. So what you can do to start with is forget everything Gary said about crimping <laughs> and the steps. <laughs> I, st I don't know. There's something about crimping I just don't trust. You know, you crimp it on, you can pull it off. Anyway, so I do it the old-fashioned way. And I don't have any of those fancy things that strip the cable for you. You know, I get the razor knife out and sort of slice it off. But the method for doing this is a little bit different. What I do is take the PL259 and I measure... Am I okay? I'm not moving up and down. Okay. <laughs> I measure the length of it from the tip to the end of the barrel. And that's where I make my first cut to take the black uh, sheath off. So I just go around with a razor knife and cut it to, to that dimension. You're welcome to come up and take a look, uh, or I can pass these around, whatever. So the second step in this is... Uh, because the difference in the way I'm going to solder this connector to what we all learned was I'm going to solder the braid around the outside of the connector. I'm not going to put the braid inside and try to solder through those little holes. So what I do is just push the braid back a bit to form like a little mushroom here, maybe about, I don't know, a quarter of an inch or so. I take my scissors and clip around that and pull the excess braid off. So then what I'm left with is uh, is this. You fold the fold the braid back over the over the sheath of the cable. Then what you do is take some just some electrical tape and this is really good for uh, making life easy. I take three wraps of electrical tape around the the inner dielectric like this. The nice thing about that is it gives you a perfect measure for a PL259. Then what I do is I take my cutters, my strippers, and I cut right at the end of this uh, piece of tape, cut the inner dielectric off, and take it off the cable. Then I tin the, uh, the, the uh, center conductor. Now, what happens at that point, and where you'll go wrong <laughs> if you did it the old-fashioned way of saying, oh, i got to put the barrel connector on first. So you sort of started by uh, unscrewing this, and on your cable you put this down, figure you put the end on, and then pull it up and tighten it up. Well, when you solder to the outside of this, this isn't going over it. So it'll save you. You don't have to think about it. I had to put that on first. See, I'm trying to make life easy for you. You don't put it on first. You leave it screwed on to your, on your connector. Now, once you've done this correctly, and so you've folded the braid back, you put the tape around, you've cut the dielectric off, the PL259 slots on just like that. Now, at this point, what I do is push it down hard, I solder that sec center conductor, clip that off, and then what I do, because the PL259 isn't coming off, but to make it easy to handle, is I just screw it into a barrel connector. You don't have to, it's just easier. Push it down good and hard, then I fold this braid back around the outside of the barrel connector. Okay, just fold it down flat like that. Then you take your soldering gun and you just go around the outside of this connector and you solder all that braid right onto the barrel connector. So what you're left with is a perfect connection of the braid to the plug. There's no chance inside that any of that's going to short out there's no chance it's going to come off because it's just solid on there. And then to finish it off, what I do, you can do it two ways. 
if you want, you can probably put some heat shrink tubing on first, pull the heat shrink tubing up and, and do it. But when the connector is warm from soldering, I just take some electrical tape and wrap it around there and finish off that connection. But that's on there. It's not going anywhere. It's not coming off. It's not twisting off. There's no possibility if you've got it connected your antenna up on the tower and the antenna's rotating around that this connection will ever come loose. So electrically, it's fantastic. Mechanically, it's fantastic. And it doesn't really take any more time. And frankly, it's a lot less frustrating than trying to solder through all these little holes on here and then ending up with something that just isn't particularly good. So there's, if you look on the website, you'll find a video, because sometimes you forget all the steps, but um, it's quite easy to do. You're welcome to take a look at, at what I've done for the various steps along this. And, uh, you know, cheap and cheerful. No big things. Yeah. Right, do you use uh, silver-plated uh, connectors? Yeah, I, I use good quality connectors. I use either Amphenol, but Amphenol connectors are getting terribly expensive, it seems. Uh, so I actually buy the packs from DX Engineering. The and reason the, for the silver question, it solders a lot easier. Yeah, yep. it's a good point. Yep. The, the silver connectors, you know, take the heat real well and solder real well. The cheap ones will give you a problem along the way. But I, I have a, I don't have as high a wattage gun. I think my gun goes to maybe 140 watts, but I have no problem soldering around the the outside of the barrel. Right, do you ever use any flux or just solder straight to it? No, nope, just solder. Wow. The Wireman has those uh, better uh, connectors also. Uh, Does he? Yes. Yeah. Well, you can get them. It just it makes sense to get a good quality silver plated connector. Any other questions? You'll solve your problem. As I say, you're welcome to have a look at at any Rick, interest. thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us tonight. Anybody else have some words of wisdom for us on connectors? Oh, and the, uh, the, the silver connectors usually have Teflon insulators, <coughs> which, which are uh, much higher. High temperature. Break down, temperature and yeah. Break down yeah, good. Carl? I have an alternate method. I've, some hams have used. You want to come up? Well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right, get up there. Carl, those who don't know me, W4CW. I've been a ham a long time too, and I've been putting on connectors for many, many years, and I've screwed up a few and learned some, a few tricks over the years, but uh, I kind of use a combination of things. I like the crimp stuff. I'm old school, but I've started doing that for the last few years only on indoor connectors. Okay. I just, I just, don't trust them outdoors from a weatherproofness condensation standpoint. But for outdoor connectors, uh, for RG8, you can only do this for RG8, not anything smaller than that. How far that minute before you put the connectors on? No, that one that Dave has. Yep, or <laughs> How many watts was that? Didn't know that you watts. You're dragging your feet, Carl. <laughs> All right, this one's what I wanted. Uh, I will take the sheath back, oh, probably about that same distance, and do not disturb the braid at all. And I will tin that entire length of braid solidly with probably a 140, 200 watt gun is about the best wattage that I have found for doing that. There's a little bit of a trick to it because if you, you want to keep moving with it once you get it hot because if you don't, you can melt your center, can, uh, center insulator, whatever it is, especially foam. But anyway, I tin that completely and then, and I apologize, I was going to bring some jumpers and so on tonight was going to gather them up this morning and uh, was awakened about 5 o'clock in the morning when the power went off. So uh, between getting the generator up and getting my wife off to work, I forgot about everything else except the little tubing cutter. I don't know how many of you are familiar with 
tubing cutters. They come in various sizes, shapes, or whatever. I don't remember where I got this one, but it's cheap and it's plastic and it works great for this. I wouldn't, don't know what I'd want to use it for copper tubing, but it uh, works great for this. But once that's 10, take your connector and get your measurements exactly right from where that braid will seat down in the connector. Take your tubing cutter and just ring it around there. Okay, and you can pull everything off. The one trick that you've got to watch out, the tubing cutter will kind of squeeze that soldered copper down over the end of your insulation just a little bit and it will close down, I guess that's a proper way to explain it, it will shorten the distance between the OD of the shield and the OD of the center connector a little bit. So you got to be careful with that. It could cause a problem. So I just take a good sharp pocket knife and just barely pull that up all the way around the edge, that fringe of that copper, and make sure that it's, it's pulled back and clean. It, it's a little more time consuming to do this this way. But then once you once you clean that up, put your connector on it, and that really makes soldering those four holes around there just many times easier than, than if you don't do that. And the practice I've always, I say always, that I do over the years now is I don't use silver plated connectors outdoors. I've, I've in a lot of years of use, I've seen the, the the silver actually degrade and corrode a little bit outdoor. So I use nickel plated outside. Nickel plated is harder to solder than, than the silver is, but I use silver inside. Of course, now I'm beginning to use crimp connectors also. And somebody mentioned the wire man. He does have good quality connectors too. But uh, to me, the, the, the quality of, of a connection, a coax connector, is it, it starts with the connector itself. You, you don't don't scrimp on money because you don't make too many of them, and you want the best connectors you can get. And somebody mentioned Teflon. That's a for the center insulator. That's certainly worth uh, worth spending money. Some, some of the cheap uh, Chinese ones have got sort of a plastic stuff that will actually it melt. will melt. Yeah, and yeah. it'll arc over at yeah. high power. Does Zamphenol really. still make the uh, the style that had that high quality phenolic insulation in there? Know. Those were great connectors too. You couldn't you couldn't damage those with, with heat at all. But anyway, that's just me. I've uh, I've been putting on a few over the years too, and, and there's no black and white method. I think different people find different. They find what works for them too. Greg's idea is different. I've, I've never done that before. That was kind With of some lines, I figure uh, K3LR knows what he's talking about. He says since he started using that technique, he's never had a failure in any of his connectors. The only failure I think I ever remember having in a connector was RG8X when I was trimming the braid. You know, it was too long before you put the reducer on one strand all it takes. fell in there, yeah. and I think I've been pulling the connector probably 30 years, and I think that's the only one I ever screwed up, and it <laughs> dead short. <laughs> dead short. I, if anybody wants to see a tubing cutter that has never seen one and doesn't know what they are, be happy to That's what around. I was telling you about on the way down here a while ago, Tom. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Northern Tool has them, and I think Harbor Freight Lowe's probably has some Lowe's yeah, and Home Depot. Are cheaper, which yep. They're not as good a quality, but you don't need it for this. Correct. You're going to yeah, cut exactly. copper every day, you need a good one. All right. Any other comments, questions? Sure. One yes, one Dave. One more yeah. thing. Uh, the, uh, the soldering guns like we saw tonight don't have a very big tip on them. So if you're actually going to try to solder through the holes, you've got to have it on there so long that you're very likely to melt the inside. What works better for that is a tip with much bigger mass. Waller has one that's about 80, 80 watts, and it's only like 20, 25 bucks. But the, the mass is so large on the, on the tip that that thing comes up temperature really fast, yeah. and, and then you don't have to heat it as long. I've got one of those. I didn't bring it in. I've got one that's I bought in Germany, but it's it's a Weller. So and when you're done, if you take a, a, a 
damp rag, you, you can cool it off faster that way. Oh, good idea. I, yeah, get an old washcloth and keep it wet and yeah. immediately yeah. cool it down. It'll yeah. sometimes save you from melting that insulation if you've had to spend a long time. <laughs> cool. Well, I thank you all for coming tonight. Hopefully, uh, got some ideas uh, percolating in your head. Um, putting on connectors is really a, a big part of amateur radio. We do it all the time, and uh, maybe uh, we'll do it a new way next time. Thanks to all of you for coming. <laughs>